Um, I don't have anything uh, off the top today. So, Sean, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Nothing. Um, well, can we, can we start maybe broadly about where things stand in the Middle East, uh, particularly with the ceasefire um, talks, that the, with the, you know, the, the idea of having talks on the 15th. Where does that stand? Do you, are you confident that talks can take place? What is the U.S. trying to do to, uh, to get to that goal? So look, uh, this is something that we are uh, working uh, around the clock every day. Um, you saw the statement that was put out trilaterally at the uh, tail end of last week from um, President Biden, um, President Sisi, and um, the Emir of, of Qatar. Um, so this is something that we uh, think, for all the reasons I've talked about before, is just so vitally important to the re region. Um, first and foremost, um, it, is, it is time for uh, the remaining hostages to to be uh, returned home, and that includes, of course, uh, American citizens. It's also uh, uh, has the potential to bring about much needed relief to the people of Gaza. Uh, and so that's what's at the table, and that's what's at stake, uh, and that's what we'll continue to, to work towards. But uh, as it relates to the negotiations, Don, Sean, and status and where things um, stand, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the process, um, just given uh, sensitivities and uh, wanting to see this process play out. Well, not, not to get too much of this specifics, yeah. but, uh, but for example, there is a, I'm sure you saw the New York Times report today about the Israeli negotiating position, um, saying that some demands made in, in recent weeks, for example, the uh, Philadelphia corridor, the, the border with Egypt that Israel has, has demanded to, um, to have control of that. Um, do you think that both sides actually want a truce and are, are ready to, to, to make some, some compromises to get there? So look, Sean, again, I'm just not going to get into the specifics of the negotiation process. That certainly uh, would not be helpful from up here, and it would uh, uh, not helpful to a, a to a sensitive process. Uh, uh, on, on whatever the reporting that is out there, Sean, I've, I've seen those reports, and I'm certainly not going to get into uh, alleged documents or comment on private diplomatic conversations. I'll also say that um, you know um, uh, the media says a lot of things, official says a lot of. Uh, government officials say a lot of things. Uh, what I can say from the U.S. perspective is that uh, we are so uh, clearly committed to this because we think it is in the vital interest of the region. Uh, as you've heard me say, we think that a ceasefire deal um, has the potential to uh, create conditions so that hostages can release, so we can be, so we can see uh, an increase in humanitarian aid, and uh, uh, more broadly, uh, create conditions for diplomacy to get the region out of this endless cycle of violence. Uh, and I will also just so note what I said yesterday that um, Prime Minister Netanyahu confirmed that his team will uh, be at the ceasefire talks on Thursday and that they'll be prepared to finalize the um, the, the details for implementing the deal. But I'm not going to get more specific beyond that. Do you know where the talks would take place? I don't have any updates on that. Just one more for you before I pass on. Um, yeah. the, the other, um, the, the Iranian uh, aspect of the yeah. equation, if you will. Uh, Obviously, there have been talks. I know the, the secretary spoke yesterday with, with the Turkish foreign minister, with the, the Iraqi prime minister, yeah. about this and other issues. Um, what's the assessment now? Do you think that there's, is there still a fear of Iranian uh, retaliation and expectation of that? Uh, where do things stand now in, in dissuading them potentially? Thanks, Ron. So I don't want to speculate on what actions the Iranian regime might take, but I will say, as the secretary has said repeatedly, no one benefits from any kind of retaliation. And what we've been engaged on uh, is intensive diplomacy with allies and partners um, who uh, are helping us communicate that message uh, to the region, um, uh, including directly to uh, Iran. And a number of ways in which we're doing that is through, of course, some of the counterpart calls that you have seen um, the secretary participate in over uh, not just yesterday, but over the past uh, uh, two weeks now. Uh, we're also communicating this message directly uh, to Israel and uh, also reiterating that our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad and will continue to defend Israel against attacks from Iran and Iran-backed terrorist groups, just as we'll continue to defend uh, American personnel. Uh, but everyone in the region should understand that further attacks only perpetuate conflict, instability, and insecurity for everyone. And so what we're focused on uh, is intensively on uh, de-escalation through diplomacy. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Welcome. Thank you Since very much. First day. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so is there any communication between the U.S. and Iran at the moment? So I'm just not going to speak to uh, private uh, diplomatic conversations. What I can say is that we have been uh, engaging with uh, partners uh, who are communicating that message directly to Iran. I'm not aware of any uh, communication between the U.S. 
And do you expect them to hold off from any retaliation until after Thursday's talk? So, as I just said to Sean, I, I certainly don't want to speculate on any timeline. Uh, what I uh, will say is that uh, we have been stressing to uh, allies, partners, like-minded, uh, the, the, just how important it is that the parties not take steps that are going to perpetuate this conflict, that are going to lead to further instability and insecurity. Uh, no one benefits from any kind of retaliation, and so we want to not see any escalation or any attack take place in the first place. And you expect Hamas to be there? So uh, we've seen the reports of what they um, have said as it relates to their participation. Uh, our partners in Qatar have assured us that they will work to have Hamas represented. Uh, as I just said to Sean, it is uh, far time for Hamas to release the remaining hostages, including the American citizens. Uh, but broadly, we fully expect these talks to move forward as they should. So regardless of whether they're there or not, the talks happen. So uh, as, as I said, Hamas, uh, Qatar has assured us that they will work to have Hamas represented there, and we fully expect these talks to move forward. Thank you. All right, Chen. So Qatar has assured that there will, they will work to have Hamas there, but it's still not guaranteed that Hamas will participate. Uh, a lot of members of the group have been saying that's because of reluctance that they perceive from Israel to commit to a deal, to implement a deal. Do you think that's the message the world should get from Hamas's uh, lack of participation if things go forward as they stand, or is Hamas unwilling to commit to it? So I, I'm I'm not going to get into the the mind of of Mr. Sinwar. Well, l let me just say a couple things. First, um, this whole process um, started. Uh, when President Biden in late May laid out a very clear proposal uh, of the contours of a ceasefire deal, uh, a ceasefire deal that was very quickly endorsed by the G7, quickly endorsed by the UN Security Council, quickly endorsed by the Arab world, endorsed by Israel, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we continue to believe that a ceasefire uh, uh, proposal in lines with that is uh, achievable. And that's exactly why you saw President Biden, President Sisi, and the uh, uh, Qatari Amir put out that trilateral statement last week. Um, it is uh, imperative that uh, these talks continue, that we get this process across the finish line because of uh, what we believe it can achieve when it comes to the hostages being released, when it comes to humanitarian aid, and when it comes to greater diplomacy for the region. And I will just you know, note again that um, in, in light of that trilateral statement, Prime Minister Netanyahu quickly confirmed that his team uh, will be at the ceasefire uh, talks on Thursday and that they'll be prepared to finalize the deals for implementing this. And simultaneously, our cutter partners have uh, assured us that they are working to ensure that there is Hamas representation as well. So uh, we'll let this process play out, uh, but we fully expect these talks to move forward as they should. And on the anticipated uh, Iranian at mm -hmm. attack on Israel, do you still see a broad level of support among the coalition of particularly Middle Eastern countries that helped defend Israel in April, or do you think that has waned? At this point? So I, I'm certainly not going to speak to uh, I'm not going to speak to um, other countries' um, efforts and how what they might be adjusting or not adjusting any security posture they're taking. What I can say is that. Um, no one is naive about Iran's malign destabilizing behavior, particularly through its proxies, proxies particularly in uh, the Middle East region. And what I can say from on behalf of the United States is that we certainly won't hesitate to defend Israel as well as our personnel from uh, not just attacks from Iran, but uh, Iranian-backed uh, proxies as well. Uh, Camilla. Uh, thanks. A couple of questions um, about other figureheads that could create potential obstacles. Um, Wall Street Journal reported that uh, uh, Sinwa had said through Arab mediators that if Israel's serious about negotiations and wants Hamas to participate in this week's talks, then uh, they need to stop all military operations in Gaza. As you know, they Hamas have made Sinwa their head of their political bureau, whatever that means. Are you guys taking what he says seriously? Is Do you see what he says as just bluster, or is it the potential to... Uh, does he have any kind of potential to, to stop Hamas's participation? How should we read this? So you saw the secretary speak to this um, last week in Annapolis um, with the appointment of Mr. Sinwar as uh, Hamas's uh, political bureau chief. Um, it, from our point of view, that uh, designation um, didn't change anything. Um, over the course of this whole process, over the course of uh, this whole conflict, um, it has been clear uh, to everyone that um, uh, Mr. Sinwar uh, continues to be the decision maker. Uh, 
And uh, when it comes to the future of the uh, Palestinian people, when it comes to uh, the ability to alleviate some of the suffering and to alleviate some of the dire situations that we're seeing in the Gaza Strip, uh, ultimately that is also uh, up to Mr. Sinwar. Uh, in response to the trilateral statement that was put out last week, uh, the Israelis have uh, confirmed that they will have a team present ready to continue and carry forward these talks. Um, it is uh, imperative that uh, Hamas uh, do the same because it is far time for these hostages to be released and uh, to bring relief to the people of Gaza. And we fully expect these talks to move forward. As I said just a moment ago, our Qatari partners are also working to ensure that there is Hamas representation. And I will let the process play out. Okay, thank that. you. And then on, is on Israel, um, you know, you guys have a lot, of, a lot at stake all the time in the region, particularly this week, you know, with these talks that you guys are, you know, really helping push into place and you but you also have figures like the national security minister in Israel Ben Gavir going up on the most explosive piece of real estate in the region again the Temple Mount uh, to um, what can only be perceived as something that he he thinks is his right to to impose his policy on something that that is not the status quo policy that Netanyahu has come out and said you know this is not this is yeah. not our government policy it the like Netanyahu can only say so much, so can you guys, this is all rhetoric when you condemn actions like that. But these actions have real potential to escalate things in the region. Uh, what is your response to what he, he's doing, like that he's doing this again? And also, is there something the US can do? Can you sanction a figure like Ben Gavir? You know, you, you are able to sanction other figures in the region. It doesn't matter that he's an Israeli government official. Is there anything that you guys can do to stop this continuing to happen? So on, on the second part of your question, Camilla, I certainly I'm just not going to uh, preview um, or get into what's possible or not possible. But I would say that we certainly are paying close attention to um, actions and activities that we find to be um, a, a detraction from Israel's security, uh, a contributor to greater insecurity and instability in the region, and that would certainly be um, the actions that we saw uh, today uh, that uh, Mr. Um, ben Gavir uh, participated in. Even uh, the Prime Minister's office itself uh, made clear that the events of this morning um, are a deviation from what is Israeli policy and a deviation from the status quo. And let me just say uh, clearly that the United States stands firmly for preservation of the historic status quo with respects to the holy sites of Jerusalem. And any unilateral action uh, would which this would be that any unilateral action like this uh, that jeopardizes such a status quo is unacceptable. And not only is it unacceptable, it uh, detracts from what we think is a vital time as we uh, are working to get this ceasefire deal across the finish line. It detracts from uh, what our stated goal is for the region, which is a uh, two state solution, a Palestinian state and an Israeli state that's side by side living in uh, uh, with dignity and harmony. Um, we recognize how important the holy site is, so we urge all sides to respect the status quo, but certainly actions like this um, are, uh, they detract from that. And um, not only do they detract from that, we find them to be uh, unacceptable. Said, go ahead. Thank you, Vedant. Uh, first, on the secretary's trip, uh, what would he? What, what does he hope to achieve this time around that he was not able to achieve in the past eight trips? Well, Said, I don't have any um, travel for Secretary Blinken to, to preview uh, at the moment. What I can say is that as it relates to the Middle East region, the Secretary is uh, laserly focused and engaged on the region uh, through calls with his counterparts, um, through calls with other leaders. He has been uh, working the phones for the past number of weeks, uh, continuing to echo the same message, which is uh, we are close to getting this ceasefire deal uh, across the finish line. It is vital for the release of the remaining hostages, including American citizens. It is vital for a surge in humanitarian assistance, which we believe will help alleviate the suffering that we're seeing in Gaza. Um, and it is vital for to help get this uh, region out of this endless cycle of violence. He uh, made that clear to uh, a number of counterparts that he's spoken to in the past few days, and I expect those kinds of conversations and diplomacy to continue, Said. but I don't want to preview or get ahead of any uh, potential travel. I know you talked about uh, you know, the, uh, the attack on the, the Tabain school yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Guterres, uh, condemned in no uncertain terms what happened, the attack, the massacre of uh, Tabin School. Would the United States do the same thing? Do, they, do you agree that such an act is thoroughly condemnable? Said, we of course mourn the loss of any civilian life, uh, and over the course of this conflict, too many civilians have been killed. Uh, but also, as I said yesterday, uh, the reason that uh, we are even having this conversation is because Hamas continues to have a track record of not just using civilians as human shields, but co-locating itself among civilian uh, infrastructure, co-locating itself among what uh, normally would be uh, facilities that have protected status. Uh, but when they become um, fronts for uh, uh, potential militant operations, certainly they have the possibility to lose their status. That does does not uh, minimize or diminish the moral and strategic imperative that our partners in Israel have to take every possible step to ensure that uh, civilian casualties are minimized. Uh, both of those things can be true. So do you have any evidence that actually militants were there at, at that as, school? As we, as we said yesterday, Said, we have been in close touch with the IDF on this and continue to uh, discuss with them. But I will also let them speak to their own military I operations. I understand, but you know what? No. You're saying that they have a track record, but that is dependent on what the Israeli army says, correct? That this is their operation. I will let them speak to it. Okay. Now, a couple more questions on the, uh, you know, the, the the New York Times is reporting that Israel is less flexible now on the negotiations. Seems that, uh, and in fact, by statements by the prime minister himself and statements by the um, defense minister, you have Gallant saying that uh, the Israeli prime minister has really backtracked. Uh, from the position uh, on the proposal that you that you mentioned on May 31 by the president. So, do you think that the Israelis have backed down, or at least the, the prime minister has backed down from what he's agreed to earlier? Uh, I'm just not going to categorize it, Said, in, in, in answering Sean's question or our, our new colleague's question. I, I said that I'm not going to get into the specifics of this ongoing negotiating process. I can tell you that the reason that the United States continues to lead on this and engage on this is because we believe it is vitally important to the region. And again, I will just note that um, when it comes to our partners in Israel, they've indicated that they will have a team present to uh, continue to finalize on implementing um, this deal. But beyond on that, I'm just not going to uh, uh, get into specifics. Uh, you are welcome to ask, because of course it's your time, but I'm, I'm not going to address them. Okay, that, that's fair. Mm -hmm. Now, the Hamas is saying that they have agreed to the proposal as it was proposed, so, and uh, there is nothing else to negotiate. Is there anything else to negotiate? Are there details that still need to be negotiated? So me answering that question would be me speaking about the negotiating process from a podium like this, which I think is wholly um, unhelpful to the process. So I'm just not going to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Alex, go ahead. Thank you. If I may quickly on the region and then I'll move to Ukraine. Sure. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, popped up in, in the Kremlin today. How close are you following this trip and what's your best Guest, uh, guess, guess about what's going on between the two and how involved or not involved has Russia been in the latest uh, situation in the Middle East? So, uh, to, to, from my vantage point, I don't think uh, Russia has really played a, 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 a role, not in uh, working to get the parties um, to get to this ceasefire stage, but also beyond that, working to be a source of humanitarian aid for uh, the Palestinian people. As it re relates to um, President Abbas's travel, I don't have um, anything to offer there. I would let the PA speak to his own engagements. Thank you. On, on Ukraine, uh, we were told since last week but not, that um, you were not entirely clear about Ukraine's uh, objectives uh, in its you know, cross-border operation. Well, today, Ukrainian foreign ministry laid it out. They said that they are the aim is to neutralize threats coming from Russian, Russia on Ukrainian territory, not to gain land. Is it satisfying enough? So, uh, Alex, it's not about uh, anything being satisfactory or not. I think what we're talking about, and again, the only reason that you and I are even talking about this subject is that uh, the only country at war uh, in Ukraine is Russia. You know, President Putin is the one who invaded Ukraine, and uh, Ukraine is defending itself from that aggression. Uh, this has been Kremlin's war of aggression from the start against Ukraine, pure and simple. And I, I just want to reiterate what some others across the administration have said, which is that we... 
were not engaged in any aspect or planning uh, or preparation for this operation. Uh, I will let the uh, Ukrainian military speak to their own operations, but uh, our role and what we are focused on is uh, supporting Ukraine be able to defend itself, uh, which uh, we believe is common sense, especially when it comes to defending itself against uh, attacks or operations that may be uh, immediately across the border. Uh, and so we will remain focused on ensuring that our Ukrainian partners have what they need to do that. Um, there are reports that Putin pulled out from Ukraine uh, today, basically to focus on uh, you know, homeland. Uh, are, are you in a position to verify this? Uh, I'm just not going to speak to specific operational updates, Alex. Uh, on this, uh, President Zelensky called on the bird to react to the latest situation in Zaporozhye. We have seen the video how Russia, uh, Russian occupiers are turning fire you know, uh, in the area. Reaction. So, I mean, Alex, I think uh, you and I have been talking about this, uh, gosh, for who, kn for who knows how many months now, but um, as was our, as I said, in 2022 and 2023, um, any kind of violent military kinetic activity so close to uh, a nuclear power plant, certainly um, uh, not only is it dangerous, um, but it uh, creates the potential for uh, enhanced risk. And that's something we certainly don't want to see. Yes, now I have one more in Iran, if I may. We have seen the uh, mass... I, you got four. I promise oh, I'll come final back to one. you. Okay. Please come back to me later. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, if we may switch to public health emergency, given sure. the multinational outbreak of monkeypox, <laughs> Does the State Department has any plan to uh, update its travel advisory with the new information? And what is the U.S. Uh, message to travelers? So um, I don't have any updates on travel advisories, Nike, but uh, we are tracking closely on the spread of MPOX in Central Africa. We are pleased to see um, international leadership in this area this year. I, I will note the United States has provided more than 17 million uh, beyond our regularly programmed uh, health assistance to support uh, MPOX preparedness and response efforts in Central and Eastern Africa. Uh, we've been collaborating with partners to build capacities to combat infectious diseases, uh, including MPOX, but also HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, and Ebola. And that line of effort has been uh, continuing for more than 20 years. We are in close coordination with the governments of the DRC and other affected countries. We're also uh, in close engagement with the WHO, uh, the Africa CDC, and other entities. Thank yeah. you. And a quick follow-up on uh, Sudan Peace Talk. Yeah. Do you have any update? Should we expect any virtual talks from SAF? So in terms of um, format, uh, Nike, I, I, I'm not in a place to, to speak to that. Uh, unfortunately, though, the SAF yet have not agreed to participate in talks uh, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, it is We are disappointed that um, that is uh, causing a delay of, of beginning talks with both parties participating, but uh, these talks will continue. We expect them to move forward. Uh, in the JEDA declaration, both the SAF and the RSF committed to expanded discussion to achieve a permanent cessation of hostilities, and I know that is what um, uh, Special Envoy Periello, Special Envoy Hammer are, are hoping to see uh, come out of this as well. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Vedan. Yeah. Uh, I know you've been asked about the Iranian aspect in the negotiations. Today there were reports that the Iranian may send a delegation to the negotiations. They disputed that, but were they offered to be on the table of the negotiations? So uh, I'm just not going to speak to the specifics of the uh, negotiation process. It would, uh, so I will just leave it at that. I don't want to get into the details. And on Hezbollah and Israel, should a retaliation happen now? If I, I know you are trying very hard to avoid an escalation, but if there is a response from Hezbollah, do you have a sense that Hezbollah or Israel understand the red lines at least to not uh, go on a wide scale? We are uh, taking every possible effort to ensure that um, all relevant actors understand that any kind of activity that we think is going to cause further instability, insecurity, um, cause further escalation is wholly unhelpful, certainly um, at, a, at a time like this. I will also just note, though, that we, of course, stand ready to uh, defend our partners in Israel and defend them from uh, attacks from either Iran or Iranian proxies. But we are working around the clock, Secretary Blinken is, uh, through engagement, through diplomacy, uh, to try and de-escalate and try to ensure that um, something doesn't happen. But this is a process that we're working around the clock. One more question on Sudan. What outcome are you, I mean, aiming to achieve if the, the Sudanese army are, aren't on the table? 
So look, these these talks uh, will go forward uh, without them. It is our hope that maybe they have a change in uh, uh, in, in decision and they um, find a way to have a representative in Switzerland. We certainly would welcome that. But again, the ultimate goal here continues to be a cessation of, uh, of, of hostilities nationwide. Thank you. DR, go ahead. Thank you, Vedan. Yeah. Going back to Secretary Lincoln's phone call with the Iraqi Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. So was this call just to talk about uh, concerns over the Iranian-backed groups in Iraq to attack the U.S. forces, or does the Secretary Lincoln send any message to Iran through the Iraqi Prime Minister as they are enjoying a very good relations with Tehran? So uh, the message was uh, pretty clear in the, in the readout. I don't have to get more, uh, I don't have more specifics to offer than that. They spoke about uh, a number of issues, including issues affecting the region and a commitment that they both shared to doing whatever possible to uh, send clear messages about uh, de-escalation and uh, not wanting to see um, any kind of conflict or violence uh, spread or grow out of hand. And then uh, last time when Secretary Blinken spoke with the Iraqi Prime Minister, they were discussing the protection of the U.S. forces in Iraq. But in less than 24 hours, the Iraqi militia groups attacked the U.S. forces in Iraq and injured seven U.S. personals in Al-Assad base. So do, do you trust the Iraqi government that they have the power to rein the militia groups to not attack the U.S. forces. Has the Secretary Blinken and the State Department shared this concern with the Iraqi government? So, look, first, let me just say broadly that, of course, we continue to believe that our uh, that the Iraqi government is a, a important partner uh, in the region. But uh, as we have said a number of times before, that uh, they also have a role to play in holding in helping hold, I should say, some of these uh, malign proxy groups uh, accountable. I and I will also just note that it, when it comes to the United States, we certainly won't hesitate to take appropriate action to hold uh, those to account who may put our personnel um, in harm's way. Thank yeah. you. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question on South Asia. Before that, I have one on the deadliest Israeli strike uh, on Gaza. You uh, talk about this in detail and express your concerns. Uh, but at the same time, it looks like you're also supporting the slaughter of innocents uh, in the name of self-defense. Um, new polls show that majority of Americans, especially the young Americans, uh, disapprove Israeli actions in Gaza. Um, how do you explain this to Americans? Because their taxpayers money, U.S. government is providing bombs, uh, small arms, and other forms of aid to Israel. So, and, I, as, and secondly, sir, how would you define the current policy of this uh, administration, which is like uh, keep expressing concerns and keep providing bombs? So first, I, I think I would just reject the um, overall premise of that uh, question. Um, I, I could not uh, disagree with it uh, more. Uh, let me just be very clear. Any number um, above zero of uh, civilian lives lost is um, wholly unacceptable to us. Um, it, it is uh, deeply, deeply um, uh, troubling and unfortunate that we find ourselves in a scenario where uh, we have a belligerent like Hamas that continues to use civilians as human shields, that continues to uh, utilize uh, civilian infrastructure and what should be protected facilities um, as safe haven. Uh, but. Uh, that does not minimize the strategic and moral imperative that um, Israel has to minimize those civilian casualties. And this is something that we take uh, uh, incredibly seriously. And when it comes to the use of our security articles, um, the State Department pays close attention and is reviewing very closely uh, potential reports of alleged international uh, human rights law and gross human rights violations through the various existing policies that we have at our disposal, which I've spent a lot of time up here uh, talking about them, as Matt has. Uh, examples include the uh, Leahy Vetti for Forum, for example, uh, guidance that is detailed under the U.S. conventional arms transfer policy, reviewing credible reports of civilian harm potentially caused by U.S. origin end items through the CHURG process, uh, and other designations and actions that we have at, at our disposal, and we'll continue that uh, line of effort. The former uh, Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina accused the United States uh, of uh, uh, orchestrating mass protests that led to her ouster after weeks of violence. Do you have any comment on that? 
Uh, that's laughable. Um, uh, any implication that the United States was involved in um, Sheikh Hasina's resignation is absolutely false. Uh, we have seen a lot of disinformation in recent weeks, and we were made uh, incredibly committed to strengthening information integrity across um, the digital ecosystem, especially with our uh, partners in South Asia. Go ahead, in the back. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, no, you read, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, yesterday, Secretary Blinken spoke to the Foreign Minister of uh, Colombia. Um, how are the efforts advancing? As we know, um, it's supposed to be a call between Maduro and the presidents of Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil. That hasn't happened. It's supposed to happen this week. Um, what are the advancements on that relationship that is being formed as a region? So uh, I think first one of the key things that um, the secretary spoke about with the uh, foreign minister was uh, the topic of what we are currently seeing uh, uh, play out in uh, Venezuela. Uh, and so two weeks after the elections in Venezuela, it has become abundantly clear, not just to the majority of Venezuelans, uh, but the United States and a growing number of other countries that uh, Edmundo Gonzalez uh, uh, Uretia, uh received the most votes on July 28th, um, and Nicolas Maduro must accept it. Uh, more than 80% of the voting tally sheets published by civil society and the opposition and corroborated by independent observers, including uh, the Carter Center, indicate that he received the most votes by an insurmountable margin. Um, and so what we are focused on, uh, the US along with other um, international partners, including countries like Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, have called for transparency and called for the release of uh, detailed vote tallies. And we urge Venezuelan parties to begin discussions to a peaceful transition back to democratic norms. And during the call, they talked about the role of the OAS. And as your statement reads, um, they wanted the region to speak with one voice and have the OAS as a center um, group. Is that possible? Um, the Foreign Minister of Colombia released in a statement just a few hours ago in which he says that he made clear the position of Colombia on the OAS. And we know that during the vote, um, the U.S. led uh, resolution with Uruguay and other countries fell to pass with 17 votes and Colombia actually abstained. Is it possible to go back to the OAS to have a conversation? That is certainly, uh, that, is our, that is our hope and that is our goal and that's what we um, hope to use the OAS as a, as a vehicle for. And Pray, final, go ahead. just Haiti, okay, go ahead. Um, during the go call ahead. it was also Haiti. Um, what is the, the, um, uh, the role that Colombia will play? According to the foreign minister, they offer to help uh, the United States in their efforts to civilize Haiti. So um, I don't have any specifics to share beyond the readout. Look, um, Haiti continues to face um, dire insecurity and certainly um, any country willing to uh, play a productive role in helping with that um, uh, would certainly be a welcome thing, but I will let the, the Colombians speak to their, their own engagement. Prime, go ahead. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yesterday, the department commemorated the 75th anniversary of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, it said, quote, it, the anniversary is a fitting occasion to reaffirm our commitment to respecting international humanitarian law. The prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, where violations of the Geneva Conventions are often addressed, seeks arrest warrants against Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as Hamas leadership. Um, Netanyahu was just welcomed by Washington. Just in recent days, the department said it wouldn't sanction a unit accused of war crimes, including binding, gagging, and killing a 78-year-old Palestinian American. Israeli forces, as has been discussed, killed over 90 people as they prayed at a school and mosque. The Israeli forces shot an American citizen as he protested illegal settlements in the West Bank. Nevertheless, the U.S. released $3.5 billion to Israel to buy more U.S. weapons. So how does the Biden-Harris administration expect Americans and the rest of the world to take such commitments towards the Geneva Convention seriously given just the past few days? So uh, we have been consistently clear that um, Israel has every moral and strategic imperative to minimize uh, the impacts of uh, on, on civilians. And when we have seen um, uh, actions or um, uh, incidents that we uh, deem to be inconsistent with that, uh, not only do we raise our concerns with the partner country as appropriate, but we factor it into and um, uh, we factor into the however which way we may implement certain policy responses uh, to 
as a deterrence for these kinds of incidents to reoccur in the future. I talked about some of these tools at our disposal um, recently, the Leahy Vetting Forum, the guidance that's laid out in the conventional arms transfer policy, the CHURG process, as well as other things like visa restrictions and designations that we have. Uh, we urge Israel to thoroughly and transparently investigate reports of uh, gross violations of human rights and take all appropriate action, and we'll continue to do that. So I know that the department and the U.S. issued certain statements um, mourning the loss of, of life from some of these killings mm -hmm. and you talk about deterrence just hours ago two twins who were newborn were killed in gaza with their mother and grandmother as their father went to collect their birth certificates they're four days old born into war experienced only war killed by war how is the you responding to this instance given, again, this comes a day after the U.S. So I, I'm not going to speak to specific instances and uh, incidents that happen. I will let the IDF speak to any operations they can take. I will say just hearing uh, this from your reporting, it, this is obviously incredibly heartbreaking. Um, and uh, again, Israel has every moral and strategic imperative to minimize civilian loss, but I don't have any of the other contours um, surrounding this uh, this um, uh, this operation, and I will let the, the IDF speak to that. Finally, finally, just one. Just yeah on a case that you do have contours for. It's now 197 days since him, the job was killed, her family members were killed, the medics said they were killed. What's the update on that? I don't have any updates for you. Go ahead. Thank you. I have a question uh, um, related to Ukraine. Uh, there was a report on the Financial Times recently about a plan from Russia um, to strike Europe with nuclear missiles in case of um, an attack of NATO. So what is the position, or if you heard about this report from the Financial Times, and what would be, um, or those, you know, Europe and U.S. support Ukraine, that, so I, what I, is I, the position I'm, about it, and what, what would be the plan? I'm not fully familiar with this report, but let me just say that uh, nuclear um, saber-rattling and rhetoric is uh, something that we have seen the Red Russian Federation do time and time again, uh, but we continue to believe that there is no reason for us to uh, change our, our nuclear posture. If I can do a quick, quick follow-up, um, 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 the Ukraine militaries are about 40 miles inside the, the, Europe, the, the Russian territories. Is it still part of what um, President Biden believed that is good to be done, like use American uh, weapons in Russia, or Ukraine is going too far right now? So there has been no change as it relates to our policy. As the president has said, we, of course, um, uh, are supportive of uh, efforts to um, uh, disrupt operations that uh, might be immediately uh, across the border. But beyond that, uh, there has been no change in policy, and I will let our Ukrainian partners speak to uh, any operation of theirs. Thank Go ahead. you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The uh, U.S. ambassador to uh, Mexico, Ken Salazar, um, has indicated that there's evidence, uh, enough evidence, uh, the, about how El Mayo Zambada was brought to the U.S. against his will. And um, the Mexican authorities are trying to question the U.S. authorities about the conditions of this arrest of El Mayo Zambada. They don't seem to have any answer or not at the answers they're expecting. Are you cooperating with the Mexican authorities to respond to those questions about the Maju Zambada arrest? Um. So uh, first, let me just say that uh, I will um, defer to the, the Department of Justice and let them speak to the situation uh, in more context and more detail, detail. But we continue to have deep cooperation with the government of Mexico under the bicentennial security framework, uh, working together to dismantle criminal networks. And uh, I can confirm that there was no uh, law enforcement operation uh, conducted uh, in Mexico. Can I follow so, up? Uh, I, gotta, I have to wrap soon, so I want to get to a couple more people. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Vedant. Um, a few questions, if I can. First of all, uh, the, the Iranian mission at the UN uh, said last week that they do have direct line of communication uh, and are talking to the Americans. Uh, are they wrong? Uh, I'm just not going to... Uh, I will let them offer any clarification to what they're saying. So they, there is a clarific they should offer a clarification? I, I, I just don't have any comment to offer. What I can say is that we uh, don't have any uh, direct uh, communication with uh, uh, the Iranian regime. Uh, the messages that we are sending is through uh, other uh, countries and allies' partners, and we are continuing to stress the importance of de-escalation and not um, uh, partaking in any activity that would be uh, construed as uh, destabilizing or um, uh, cause causing greater, greater insecurity. Thank you. And, and following on from that, um, it, it appears that the, the, certainly the reporting is suggesting that the Iranians are now um, putting 
are now suggesting that there any retaliation will, will be dependent on the success or otherwise of the talks uh, this week, the ceasefire talks. How does that change the framing of, of, of Thursday from your perspective? It doesn't, and I think I've answered this question um, a couple of times already. So I'm happy for people to, to tune in, but when you are asking the same questions as your colleagues ask, you're kind of wasting their time. Okay, so well, I'm gonna stop. Can there. I just, can Thanks, I just ask one more about the- um, Thank you, everybody. I have a hard out today. <laughs>